Well, people know that we're dealing with technical issues. Facebook is sharing. We do have a live stream happening. Again, thank you for your patience. You got it now? All right. Thank you very much for my tech support. I really appreciate that. Uh, sorry about the delay there, folks, but we'll go ahead and get it started now. Um, I'd like to welcome to Owls of Indiana, presented by Crawfordsville District Public Library, and narrated by myself this evening. I'm Stephanie Morissette. So without further ado, we will go ahead and get started and learn as much as we can about who these owls are, what makes them owls, and why they are so mysterious and how we can demystify them. Owls have generally had different uh, associations throughout time. I think a lot of us can say that as children growing up, owls were associated with darkness and night, uh, graveyards, cemeteries, and old spooky castles, and just associated with um, Halloween in general. But it wasn't always so with owls. Throughout history, Owls have been given portent for different things. In Greek and Roman mythology, owls were actually considered good omens and protected soldiers before battle. So these good omens of owls were considered to be evidence of an impending victory. So much so were owls important that the Athenian trade and commerce actually adopted a coin with the little owl's watchful eye upon it, as you can see in the upper uh, image there. Now, in English folklore, I think that might be where the owls came about as having a spooky connotation, uh, because hearing an owl, uh, older generations and older cultures thought, oh, no, that meant imminent death. Um, and so they came up with odd ways to try to combat that fear. And one of them was actually nailing a dead owl onto their door to ward off evil. Now, I'm not sure if that worked but they also tried cooking owl eggs down into ashes and then ingesting them, hoping to gain better night vision. Now, I don't know about you, I'm not sure if that would work or not, but uh, these are some of the things that early peoples and cultures believed. And then finally, we can make mention of different indigenous peoples around the world and even here in um, North America. Owls were considered to be not only a spirit animal for some, but also uh, messengers or givers of omens from the dead. Now, this did not necessarily have a negative connotation to it as spirit animals were generally considered guides and being visited by an owl did not necessarily mean the deliverance of bad news from a dead relative or a dead loved one. As you can see in the lower image, there is a stone carving of an owl. It's also known as a petroglyph. And this owl is termed the Speedus Owl, and it's currently part of the Horse Thief Lake State Park in Washington. Owls in pop culture, owls just keep getting better. Uh, I might be dating myself here during this time of this program, but some of you may remember the Woodsy Owl commercials in around 1977. The U.S. Forest Service had a campaign for Give a Hoot, Don't Pollute and Woodsy Owl was their mascot. So again, dating myself back into the 70s here, uh, many of you are familiar with Tootsie Rolls and of course the famous Tootsie Pop. And back in the day, Mr. Owl had a question that was always prompted to him. Mr. Owl, how many licks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Roll Tootsie Pop? Now, for those of you that can date yourselves as well as me, at the end of this program, uh, if you know the answer to that, I'm going to request that you email your response for an entry into a drawing that we will have for two really cool uh, owl prizes at the end of the program. So stay tuned. Who or what are owls called then? Well, we've discussed how owls were important in different cultures for different reasons. And a group of owls or a flock, I guess you could say, of owls were named a parliament or a congress. And the reason they've been given those names are 
for a lot of the things we've mentioned, but also to denote a measure of cultural and intellectual abilities that uh, certain early noblemen, noble women, and royalty had. And so as their people and their assistants took notes and ledgers and such, it kind of rolled over into owls or wise. And so we're just going to kind of carry that theme on. So as you can see, it's really uh, followed the owls throughout history. Owls in literature even. William Shakespeare had 13 different references to owls in many of his different plays. Some of those are listed at the bottom of the left-hand image there. And for our younger patrons, well, including myself, I love the world of Harry Potter and Hedwig the Snowy Owl was probably a friendly introduction to many people to the world of owls. Moving along to some interesting owl information, there are 216 species of owls across the world and they are divided into two families. The two families that we're gonna talk about this evening are Tectonidae or the barn owl family in which there are 18 species. And the Tectonidae family, all those species of owls have heart-shaped facial discs. So if you look at the upper left-hand image, that is a barn owl. And I must say a beautiful female barn owl at that with the beautiful mottled speckles on her chest. And then we have Strigidae or the true owl family in which has 198 species. Now two of these owls, one on each extreme of large versus small. If you look at the image on the right, that is a Eurasian eagle owl and it weighs 10 pounds. So that's bones, feathers and feet. <laughs> And then we have the smallest owl, the elf owl, which only weighs in at 1.1 ounces. Uh, this little guy is native to the southwestern United States, as well as Baja, California, and down into Mexico. And another is interesting thing to note is that not all owls hoot. They make a whole variety of noises, including screeches, chirps, whistles, shrieks, screams, barks, growls, rattles, and hisses and we will get to sample some of these different vocalizations as we move throughout the program tonight. Uh, and I want to encourage you, anyone who has a question as we go along during the program, please feel free to type them in and I will be responding uh, in as a timely manner as possible to address your questions. So here we have Titonidae or the barn owl family with the heart-shaped facial discs and the only owl that we will be discussing in this family is the barn owl, which is located right there left of center. In the Strigidae classification or the true owl family, we will be focusing mainly on these types of owls. We will be discussing the snowy owl. We will also be discussing the northern Solwit owl, which is down there in the second line over towards the right. But the three species that we'll be focused mainly on tonight are, are the most common owls in Indiana, and those include the barred owl, which is right there next to the snowy owl. Then we have the great horned owl, and then we have the eastern screech owl. Owl characteristics. Owls are raptors or birds of prey, which simply means they, that they catch their own food. They catch their own prey, animals or insects or whatever their diet includes. Um, and this is what makes them birds of prey. Now, all birds have feathers for the most part, I would hope, unless perhaps they're molting. But for flight and tail feathers, they are contoured or they are slightly shaped to aid in flight or um, landing, depending on, you know, the tail feathers are fanned out or the wings are wide or whatnot. But these contoured feathers for flight in particular on the wings have a special adaptation with little barbs or barbules. And I'm referring to the lower left-hand image. You can see some very fine fringe-like feathery nature on the edges of those flight feathers. And these little fringes on the edge of the feathers allow the bird to have silent flight. And it is termed fluting. That little fringe-like feathers on the edge of the, of the edge of the primary wing feathers is called fluting. So that's how we get our silent flight. Owls also have downy feathers, just like other birds, uh, which allows them to fluff up and trap air under the feathers to create an insulation. 
Owls also have bristle feathers or stiff feathers around their bill and their eyes and their eyelashes. And this just kind of helps function so they know uh, where their prey is in relation to their face. And we'll talk about why that's important here shortly. Uh, phyloplumes, which are hair-like feathers that are along the feet and bill. They're very fine, soft, uh, and they function to help the owl determine pressure and vibration around their uh, face and feet, uh, particularly when it comes into relation to prey and if the prey happens to be struggling or if they're ready to move it from their feet to their mouth. Uh, and finally, probably my most favorite thing about owls are their plumicorns. Plumicorns are actually um, tufts of feathers that resemble ears. So if we look at the image just to the right of the um, lower left-hand image, that great horned owl has fairly large plumicorns. Though they are feathers and not ears, they actually function to funnel sound towards the ear cavities. And as we know, just with other birds, owls have hollow bones, which allow them, in addition to feathers, to be able to take flight and support their weight uh, while in the air. Interesting to note about owls is they have what's termed zygodactyl feet, which means that they have two talons that point forward and two talons that point backward. But they have the nice evolutionary adaptation that they can pivot one of their back toes forward to help them grip their prey or to walk along a perch or a branch. Let's talk about owl ears. Owl ears are asymmetrical on their skull, meaning they're kind of at odd angles. They don't quite line up directly across uh, where our ears do, right across from one another on each side of our head. In the upper left-hand image, you can see the red arrow pointing to the ear cavity of a barred owl there. And then the upper right-hand image, you can see an owl skull overlay and the two red arrows there denoting the points or the locations of the ear cavities on the owl. And they are not directly across from one another, but at an angle. If we look to the middle image of the of the owl face, the barn owl face with that heart-shaped facial disc, you'll see that it actually, it, it provides, it's a function that funnels sound towards the ears in the way, in the manner in which it's shaped and slightly concave. In addition, the facial disc is, because it is forward facing, it'll, it allows for a sort of a greater depth perception, particularly in low light hunting conditions. And due to the fact that owl's eyes are fixed in their head, meaning they can't move their eyes around like we do, they literally have to move their head from side to side and up and down or all around to be able to take in their environment around them. Uh, but because owls have 14 vertebrae in their neck as opposed to seven like humans do, this gives them the versatility to rotate their head and neck 270 degrees. So that's side to side, up, down, and almost all the way around. The head and eyes of owls can tell us a lot about the species, in particular, their eye color. Owl eye color can denote whether the owl is nocturnally active, which means at night, diurnally active, which means during the day, or even crepuscular, which means they're kind of active during the twilight hours, pre-dawn and dusk. And 60% of all owls are nocturnal, where the remainder being uh, diurnal. And in these images here, you can see that one owl, the barred owl in the upper left-hand image has dark eyes. And for a long time, I really associated that the barred owl's more active during the day. But through the research of this program, I found that it's actually, it, the opposite is true. They are more active at night. And hence their darker eye color allows them a greater ability to allow low light conditions into their eyes for hunting in the dark. Whereas the other three images, all the owls have yellowish colored eyes, which denotes that they are typically active during the day. And again, with research for this program, it turns out why well, I thought that the, the lighter colored 
uh, owls would be active at night. So I actually learned a lot doing this program. Owls have three eyelids. I find this rather odd. So their first eyelid closes down as in just their normal blinking and the bottom eyelid closes up for sleeping. Now they actually have a third eyelid that is for cleaning the eye and it's transparent and it's called the nictitating membrane. And it actually moves laterally across the owl eye, sort of like a windshield wiper would move across the windshield of your car. Earlier on, we spoke of owls having the phyloplumes and such and the small bristle-like hairs and bristle-like feathers around its bill and eyes and even on its feet, the phyloplumes. Well, the reason they have those specialized feathers is because owls are actually far-sighted. They cannot see close up. So they rely on those phyloplumes on their face and their feet to sense where their prey is and when and where to put it into their bill and gulp it in one entire setting. After owls eat their food, uh, they form what's called an owl pellet. And because they gulp their food and swallow it whole, it passes directly from their mouth into what's called a gizzard. And the gizzard functions similar to our stomach in that there's digestive juices in there and they can kind of mix with a little sand or some tiny gravel bits to help break up the usable digestible parts of the prey. But for the parts that can't be digested, the owl has to rid itself of those because it can't store it for later digestion as most other birds can because they have what's called a crop or a bag-like organ that they can store food in for later digestion. Owls don't have that. So literally the upper right hand image, that owl is projecting an owl pellet. Uh, and the images you see surrounding that are examples of different owl pellets. Uh, the first time I saw one, I did not know it was an owl pellet. It, to me, looked something very different. Uh, it is not. It's actually owl vomit, if you will, of all the parts that can't be used of the prey. And owl pellets are extremely important in knowing an owl's diet, and therefore you can help pinpoint better what species did species of owl it is that might be resident to your neighborhood or your farm. Owls use uh, only about three different types of hunting and those they're they're pretty lazy hunters for the most part I guess you could say. They perch and pounce or they wait until they see their prey then they swoop down grab it and find a location to eat it. Owls do do some flight hunting called quartering where they'll just basically comb a certain area and section it off and fly around looking for prey a little at a time. Hovering is one that I know owls do use. They, if they do spot prey, they will hover above where the prey's location is and hover in place until they detect the prey's motion again and then pounce. Now we're gonna get into the, the meat of the program, or I guess I should say the owls of the program. And these are the species that we're gonna talk about tonight. As I mentioned, the top three we will be focusing a little bit more of our time on are the barred owl, the great horned owl, and the eastern screech owl. But the other owls I have mentioned here, the snowy owl, barn owl, the uh, northern sawa owl, the long-eared, and the short-eared owls. These guys are really masters of camouflage. So even if we were to hear owls during the day, we might not be able to see them due to their camouflage. Barred owl, Strix varia, probably say is my favorite owl of Indiana. These guys, we have found fossils for the barred owl as back as 11,000 years, which was around the time of the last ice age. So they've been here for quite a while. Uh, the oldest wild barred owl that was found was dated to be 24 years old. So that's the oldest on record that we have of a living owl in the wild. Now, barred owls have what I would consider a, a, a small home range of roughly about a square mile. But these owls are very territorial and will make a ruckus should you come into their area. Whether you're a larger animal than they are, they will let you know that you're in their area. And barred owls are year-round residents here in Indiana. They really like our uh, deciduous forests or uh, tracks of trees that that are unbroken. 
This gives them the ideal habitat that they need to hunt for their prey, which consists of rodents and smaller birds, uh, including smaller owls like the eastern screech owl. If they can catch reptiles and amphibians, I'm sure they incorporate them into their diet as well. Uh, I would like to note, too, that the barred owl, though it preys upon smaller owls, is itself preyed upon by larger owls in Indiana. That would be the great horned owl. Something else that's important to note is that barred owls are used as what's called an indicator species. So in the environmental terminology, uh, these birds, because they require more mature forested tracts of land uh, with some dead trees for nesting, um, a lack of these environments makes the barred owl sensitive or susceptible to population changes within their species. With habitat destruction and a lack of contiguous, continuous forested areas, um, reduced population numbers of the barred owl can let you know, hey, this sensitive species is telling us we need to pay attention uh, to what we're doing to the habitat for these, these species. The barred owl is named so for the vertical and horizontal brown bars on its chest that overlay a white background. They have a yellow bill and their wings and tail are also barred the brown and white. The dark eyes denote that it does hunt usually at night, but I myself have witnessed them multiple times being active during the day. Now, whether that was I was passing through their home territory and they decided to let me know or whether they were actually hunting, I, I, I just have seen them active during the day more so than at night. Um, a lot of birds of prey, owls are no exception, have what's called a sexual dimorphism, which just simply means that the girls are bigger than the boys, and generally by about a third. So they can be uh, significantly larger than their male counterparts. Here in this image, this is the barred owl range. You can see Indiana right there falls pretty much in the center of barred owl range. So everywhere in that blue purple color is the barred owl's home range or where they're where they can live. Barred owls begin their courtship in early February um, and they will usually mate for life given the female accepts the male's advances. Now, during this time of courtship, before the female actually selects her mate, he may gift her with food, he may preen her, he may coo at her, he may flap his wings or bill snap, uh, put on a show to show her that he's the ideal mate for her. So once they decide that they, they're to be mated, the breeding will generally occur uh, anywhere between March and August, but they only really have one clutch a year. So I guess it just depends on when the timing is right for the barred owls to have their, their clutch but they nest in natural cavities and trees anywhere from 20 to 40 feet off the ground. They just like to be up a little higher. Um, so these natural cavities, old holes in trees, dead snags, um, even abandoned nests by other uh, squirrels or birds, they will utilize. Barred owls has, have also used nest boxes. Uh, so they're really not overly picky on where they do decide to nest, but if they choose an abandoned nest or a deserted one, they generally, the female will do some interior decorating and lively up the cavity a bit with some lichens or maybe some evergreen bows and even feathers from her own body. Barred owls may lay only one egg or even upwards to five eggs. And again, they only have one brood per season. The incubation during all this time is the female sitting on the eggs, and during this time she relies on the male, her mate, to bring her all her meals. So after about 30 days, the chicks hatch, and these young fledglings uh, are in the nest for about another month, and then once they fledge the nest, uh, the parents kind of help feed them for just a little while longer to make sure that they're good to survive on their own. Here we are going to listen to some of those wonderful barred owl calls. Some of you who live in more rural areas in Montgomery County or wherever you are in Indiana or elsewhere might recognize this barred owl call. This is generally denoted as who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all?
And here's a monkey call. The first time I ever heard this, I was on a night hike in a park giving that hike to a group of people. And we came across barred owl territory and the sounds that they began to make rose the hairs on the back of my neck. And this is what it sounded like. This is called, this is known as the monkey call. And for those of you that are struggling with hearing um, some of these owl sounds, you might try using an earbud. Uh, that might give you greater ability to hear it. Um, this final vocal we're going to hear is of a mated pair. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the barred owl. Let's uh, move right along into our next species, the great horned owl. And I want to just uh, stop for here just a second to see uh, if some of you could respond in on your comments and let me know if you've been able to hear those owl vocalizations so that we can maximize the fun of this program this evening. In the meantime, we will continue on with our wonderful knowledge of the great horned owl. The great horned owl, or Bubo virginianus, has those fancy plumicorns, the long feathery projections on the top of its uh, head. This bird also has short stubby wings, but those short stubby wings allows it to have greater maneuver maneuverability through the air when it's uh, chasing its prey or in pursuit of. These guys, these owls have an extremely diverse uh, area in which they can live. Their range is from the Arctic all the way down to the tropics around the equator and all the way across the United States too, from deserts to the Pacific Northwest up to the Arctic, even around here in Indiana. They, they just really have perfect habitat and are adapted to a lot of these different environments. Great horned owls also have a very diversified prey diet, more so of any owl in North America. These guys eat small and even some large rodents. If they can catch some uh, snakes, they'll eat those too. Anything really that they can catch because they have such a wide ranging palate allows them to eat a lot more food and be rather successful uh, being an owl and being a, a apex predator in Indiana. Great horned owls prey upon the barred owl, which we just spoke about, and then therefore also preys on smaller owls like the eastern screech owl, which we will talk about him here in a minute. Great horned owls, if their prey population is high enough, may even store uneaten prey for a few days. Uh, so if it's frozen, they come back to it, they may sit on it and incubate it, if you will, to thaw it out before they gulp it down. These magnificent raptors have 28 pounds of pressure just to open their talons. And when they snap shut, that vice grip lock severs the spine of their prey. So it's almost an instantaneous death. Here you can see on the range map where great horned owls can live year round. All right, so let's see here. I think some of you are having problems here in the owls. Uh, apologize about that. We'll see if that improves here a little later on. If not, at some point, we hope to have uh, this up and recorded to be available online for uh, post-program viewing. So as we have that information, when it comes up, we will definitely post that on Facebook. So, um, so when we get to the uh, great horned owl vocalizations here in a minute, we're gonna kind of use our backup uh, uh, handheld devices to aid in hearing some owl vocalizations tonight. It's always fun when you're trying to work with technology. Uh, so great horned owls, when they mate, um, they mate for life, however, they don't generally hang out the entire year. So if they're not mating and actively nesting, 
they hang out on their own and just generally come together for the mating season. These birds, uh, the males will just try to woo the females with their various different tactics, grooming, preening, gifting with food, uh, calling, wing flapping, all those uh, important courtship rituals. Again, the females display the dimorphism where they are larger than the males. You can see that evident in all three of these images. However, the males, even though they're smaller than the females, they have a deeper voice box giving them a deeper call or deep, deeper vocalization. And when you hear the male and the female great horned owls, you can definitely tell the difference in pitch and you can note that for sure. <clears throat> great horned owl nesting. These, these owls are one of the first to nest in the spring. They'll start courting clear back in October through December. Uh, when they finally settle down after the dating period, that can be into January. Uh, the male will choose the nesting site and then the female will just basically hunker down right there. She doesn't do a whole lot of upkeep or interior decorating of the nest. She's pretty much just ready to get down to business. Uh, a clutch size for the great horned owl is relatively small, only two to three eggs. The female does the incubation again for give or take 30 days. And then once the chicks actually hatch, both the male and female provide food to the chicks. And after they fledge, they tend to stay around, the parents stay around a little bit longer uh, just to ensure that they're well fed before they are out and surviving on their own. When they nest, they do nest in trees, but they've been known to nest on platforms, even on outcrops of um, I can't, I lost my word. Cliff edges, there we go. I couldn't find my word. Cliff edges, so they'll just nest right on outcrops uh, with no need for decorating or anything of that nature. They may use the same nest site over and over, and they may occupy a nest site for a few months before the female actually lays the eggs. So no interior decorating. Okay, so here we're going to try a little modification on listening to some great horned owl vocalizations. Sure. Well, the first one we're going to listen to right now on our modified uh, technological device is a territorial hoot by a great horned owl. All right. I hope some of you were able to hear that with a little more clarity. If not, again, we apologize, but we're going to keep on going. I want to try something here. Um, real quick, I'm going to maximize my volume and we're going to see if we can pick up on mine. If not, we're just going to go ahead and, and skip the wonderful parts of the vocalizations. Again, we will have that available online for, for sure uh, sometime post-program and we will keep you updated on Facebook when that happens. So here we're going to listen to a pair and please try to note the change in pitch between the male and the female. Okay, it seems we're still having some difficulty. And finally, one more alarm call. I'm not sure if, if those were successful, but we're going to keep on going. We're going to keep on going. Our next species of owls, the eastern screech owl, Megascopsagio, is only six to eight inches tall, it's about the size of a robin. He's got a really short neck and he's about the size of a pint glass, if you caught all that in one long sentence. These little guys have the tiniest little plume corns, and there are two morphs or two color varieties of the eastern screech owl. One is a grayish brown and the other is a red or a rust color. The, red, the reddish color of screech owl color morph is less common than the gray, and only a third of these individuals in the species actually exhibit that, that reddish rust coloring. And you can see in the lower image two of the eastern screech owls that are directly together that have the same color morph. So 
a red colored female might pair with a gray colored male um, or vice versa. And these owls probably have the best call of any owl. And it's because to me, they sound like many horses. And I really, really hope you get to hear this for the first time here in a few minutes. Here again, we see those color morphs. And this owl, because it is so small, will prey upon small rodents. It'll eat crayfish or larger insects, earthworms. Um, and they've been, even been known to catch bats because they're such agile flyers. However, they're kind of lazy too as a hunter because they do the perch and pounce. So they'll sit on a branch, they'll spy their prey, they'll drop down, grab it, swoop back up in a large U-shaped pattern. So they really don't go more than 75 feet between branch to branch once they touch the ground and go back up. Uh, when they do have a lot of prey and there's a, a large population of prey, they will also cache extra food for a few days, similar to the great horned owl. Again, Indiana Falls, right in prime range for the Eastern Screech Owl. When these uh, owls mate, they do so between March and mid-May. They too mate for life, but they again have those looser associations between mating seasons where they live apart and then come back together uh, as a couple. Sometimes a male Screech Owl has been known to take a second female and basically boot out the first, and then the second female will incubate both clutches of eggs. But um, I hear that the divorce, weight, the divorce rate among raptors is less than 5%, so perhaps. Uh, these owls are, are common owls of the suburbs or uh, closer to here in town. They're small, they're able to adapt to the environment here, and they're more successful because there are a reduced number of predators. There are no larger owls that would more often prey upon them. These guys don't even use a nest. They're the laziest of all the birds we've talked about in their nest making abilities. The female will just find a spot, sit down and try to just nestle down and use her breast to make an indentation on the ground in an, in an empty nest box or anywhere that strikes her fancy. But once these eggs, once these eggs hatch, uh, the young chicks, uh, anywhere for between two to six of them, uh, can actually kill one another. And this can happen. It's known as siblicide. And they might kill their siblings in years where prey populations are less and it's harder for the parents to, uh, get the meals to provide them nourishment in order to ensure their survival. So some of the larger chicks, may kill their younger siblings in order to ensure that they have a better possibility of survival. I would like to take a second here and talk about this image in the upper right, in the upper right here. Uh, these guys, it takes them a while before they really can fly and hunt successfully. So they rely on their parents to uh, help keep them up to speed on what they need to do in order to take care of themselves. But the females will roost communally with the young in some situations. This upper image here of these baby screech owls remind me of a book called Owl Babies. If you have not read it to your little ones, I highly recommend you do because Sarah and Percy and Bill are the three best owlets ever. And the story is very heartwarming. So Look for it in your children's area. Uh, we actually don't have a copy here now at the public library, but it is on request for order. Hopefully we'll have that soon. And it's, I'm telling you, it's the best owl book for babies ever. All right, here are our screech owl vocals. We're going to attempt our backup technology this time because you've got to hear these little owls. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So here we go. This is called the Winnie. And that's known as the Winnie of the Eastern Screech Owl. We've got a couple other noises, uh, noises, sounds. sounds of the Screech Owl that we'll uh, try to get on here in just a second. Calls and a bill clap. We've got some bill snapping and clapping going on here in this next one, so they're feeling yeah. agitated.
All right, so hopefully you were able to hear a couple of those. And when I mentioned them being like small horses, their whinny really sounded like it. They have another vocal that's called a trill. It's similar to the whinny. Um, and we'll talk about some bird resource apps here at the end of the program that I would highly recommend you visit uh, that will give you uh, definitely some better vocal sounds, uh, vocal qualities. But um, just be good resources to have on your phone if you're an active birder. Again, here we see our two color morphs of the Eastern Screech Owl. So those are the three common ones that I really wanted to focus on tonight. And we're going to move on into uh, just a brief summarization of some of these other owls I've mentioned. The barn owl, uh, Titonidae, in the barn owl heart-shaped facial disc family. The barn owls are, if you ask me, they're the scariest owls that, um, I, the, the scariest sound that I've ever heard. And they have a really eerie, raspy scream. So when you think of scary owl sounds, this is what it's, this is what is meant. Um, early on, I said that the female barn owls have uh, more coloration than the males. So they have a reddish rust and gray in there, but they're also known to have the um, speckled chest with the brown spots. These owls can lay rather large clutches, up to 18 eggs. They can have multiple broods per year, so that could be a lot of barn owls. However, it should be noted that barn owls here in Indiana are becoming rather rare, and that is due to habitat loss, specifically uh, the loss of old barns and buildings that have been abandoned over time. They really, that, that's how they got their name is because they tend to, to nest in old barns and buildings. And with the loss of that type of habitat, it makes it harder for the barn owl to be successful at reproducing. So we should have some barn owl vocalizations here. And be prepared. This is the nightmare version of the barn owl. Well, there's multiples, but... That's a hiss. <laughs> All right, so we had two examples there. Thank you to my wonderful uh, coworker here who's assisting me in all these applications. Um, this little guy, he's so cute. He's even smaller than the uh, screech owl. This is a solwit owl, a northern solwit owl. This little guy is cat-like. He's got these bright little yellow eyes and almost sounds like a cat too. He's one of the most common owls in Indiana. However, he's so reclusive, he's seldom seen. Uh, they will nest in old woodpecker holes and smaller nest boxes that you might have around for uh, maybe say a wood duck, possibly. And let's see if we can get some cute solid L sounds. So this guy sounds like doo, doo, doo. So as you can see, it can resemble the sound a cat makes. Short-eared owl. This owl is found in Indiana, though not so much as the other owls we've discussed. The short-eared owl has short plume corns. You can tell by the color of his eyes that he's more active during the day. These owls will just simply nest right on the ground. Um, in open areas, weedy fields, crop stubbles, even on rocks and rock quarries. The short-eared owl is widely distributed across the world, and um, it's just a very common owl. However, I will say that though some of these images, you don't see the plumicorns, they usually don't have them upright. We have some short-eared owl vocalizations here, which I think we're just going to go ahead and probably skip tonight. 
Again, I'll reference some of these applications at the end of the program where you can really get justified sounds for each of these owls. Uh, because that's a very important component of this program tonight, was to be able to hear these owls with clarity. Our next cousin we're talking about here is the long-eared owl, and it's denoted by his name. He has some rather stout plumicorns. These guys are good at camouflage and hiding out in really thick areas of undergrowth and shrubs, uh, tall grasses like prairie grasses, and they can be rather vocal with a wide variety of different sounds. Interestingly enough, these birds can nest communally or roost, excuse me, roost communally in large groups or large congresses or parliaments, if you will. And they're actually not as territorial as other owls because they find it acceptable that they can nest within uh, give or take 50 feet of other nesting long-eared owls. So they're, they're pretty chill for the owls we've been talking about. And here again... There are some different vocalizations that I recommend you check out when we have the opportunity here. And last but not leastly, we have our snowy owl, the Hedwig of our Harry Potter days. The females and immature juveniles tend to have more of that black and white salt and pepper barring on them, whereas the males tend to be whiter or even mostly white. These birds they don't even nest either. They just ride on the ground uh, in, in open areas around, um, excuse me, lakes and oceans in the Arctic. But the interesting thing about these birds is that if they find a suitable location, a suitable habitat to nest, it could be farm fields. It can even be in urban environments like airport, airport land, tracts of land that have been conserved for airports and just basically uh, open space. So they'll maximize any any area they can in order to uh, reproduce and hunt successfully. The snowy owl is the largest owl by weight in North America, at, coming in at four pounds. So that's even a little bit more than the great horned owl, but substantially less than the Eurasian eagle owl that came in at 10 pounds we talked about at the very beginning. The snowy owl most commonly hunts lemmings, which are small rodents found in the Arctic or in the colder areas, as well as ptarmigans, which are birds that fall into their prey diet too. And the snowy owl can hunt both day and night or 24 hours a day, depending on where it's at, provided that its prey populations are where they need to be. Snowy owls have what's called an eruptive migration, which means that, that it can be medium or long-term migration. And that is dictated by, again, their prey population. Do they have enough to eat? Do they need to move south for the winter to find more prey where it is a little bit warmer? If you look at the, this map image, you can see there's a blue dotted line all the way across the United States and even comes across a bit of Indiana there. This is the, the lower range of the snowy owl's migration. And the snowy owl has actually been sighted in Eagle Creek Park on various years. Now, whether or not they return year after year probably depends a little bit on the owl and the prey population as well. The male will select the territory for nesting and then the female will choose the nest site within there. They like places that are a little a little up on the tundra, they have a small rise where it's a little bit windswept and they can have a better vantage point. The female will just scratch out a spot with her, with her talons and nestle right down in there on the bare ground and lay those eggs. They may reuse the same nest site and they also have rather large clutches up to 11 eggs or so, but they only have one clutch per year, which is different than the barn owl, which could have up to three. And in years where prey populations of lemmings and ptarmigans are high, the parents will continue to gift the nest uh, for the owlets for the hatchlings so that they have a continuous supply of prey that they can feed them as they go. In the lower image on the, in the right there, those are ptarmigan, excuse me, those are lemmings lying all around the chicks, those brown lumps. Snowy owls, for as beautiful as they are, are the quietest of all the owl species that we've talked about this evening. Uh, I found it difficult to find vocalizations for the snowy owl because they are so quiet. 
Um, so they really didn't have a lot of noise to make and it wouldn't do it justice if I tried to uh, play their low bark or their quiet squeal right now. But we'd like to thank Hedwig for being the symbol of Harry Potter for us this evening and helping us learn about the different owls of Indiana. Uh, a lot of these different owls, more information, as I mentioned, can be found with these bird guide resources that you can get for not only your laptop, but also for your iPhone or your Android device. Two of those apps that I would recommend are one or the other, or even both, the Ottoman Bird Guide app by the uh, National Audubon Society, and then the Merlin Bird ID app, which is the one I use predominantly, though I do have both. And that is through the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. You can download these on the App Store or Google Play. For hands-on educational owl resources, I recommend Indy Park's Eagle Creek Park. They have a nature center called the Ornithology Center. Ornithology basically just means the scientific study of birds. And at the Ornithology Center there at Eagle Creek Park, they do have raptors and birds of prey, owls included, that have been injured and have not been able to be uh, recuperated enough to be returned to the wild. So they're used solely for educational purposes, but you would be able to visit the site and see these live birds of prey. The Cornell Lab, again, of ornithology is a good place. You can find out all kinds of information on pretty much any owl you wanna know. And then finally, the Indiana Department of Natural Resources, Division of Forest, or excuse me, Division of Wildlife, on their owls, raptors, and birds of prey page. With all that information, and even with the technological glitches, I really wanna thank you for tuning in tonight. And for those of you that remember early on, I asked if you remembered how many licks it takes to get to the center of a Tootsie Roll Tootsie Pop. If you think you know the answer, please email ask at cdpl.lib dot in dot us this will prompt you to be put into a drawing for one of two wonderful owl prizes one is a leather bound a leather bound owl notebook for taking all your wonderful field owl notes in and the other is a hand carved wooden uh, glass coaster set uh, so if you are interested in entering into that raffle please send a question, comment, or suggestion to the attention of me, Stephanie, at ask at cdpl.lib.in.us, and then we can put your name in a raffle and determine who's going to win these owl standing surprises this evening. With that, uh, enjoy the rest of your evening, and thank you for tuning in. And one more final announcement for those of you that attended the first Trees 102 program, or excuse me, 101 program. The second part of that program will be November 10th. That's a Tuesday at 6 p.m. Tree ID 102, and that's for winter weather tree identification. So we look forward to seeing you that evening as well. Thank you and good night.